This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily Bloomberg iHeart podcast. And I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael, Managing Editor of Crypto for Bloomberg News. It's Wednesday, February 15th. The best known figure of the FTX bankruptcy is co-founder and former CEO Sam Bankman fried This isn't surprising, given his public profile and frequent media appearances alongside politicians and celebrities. But SBF, as he's commonly known, isn't the only FTX-affiliated player who's attracted the attention of regulators and prosecutors since the crypto exchange collapsed in November, along, of course, with Alameda Research. So who are some of those folks? And what's next for them? Bloomberg reporter Hannah Miller joins me now. Hannah, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. You've been busy, as usual. And one of the things that seems to have been keeping you busy is reporting on various of the folks associated with different parts of FTX who are not Sam Bankman-Fried. Tell me about your recent interview with Brett Harrison. Yeah, so I had the opportunity to, to talk with Brett Harrison, who's the former president of FTX US, which is the US exchange that's part of the very complicated and confusing FTX family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, Brett is working on a new venture. It's a startup called Architect. And he recently raised $5 million for this new startup. And Architect is building crypto trading software that will make it easier for institutional investors to access crypto markets, both centralized and decentralized. Now, when I first heard that he was raising money, I had like an immediate follow-up question, which was like, who is he raising money from? And, you know, similarly, has he found it difficult in this environment where there's such a huge cloud over everyone who was associated with FTX or FTX US or Alameda to be raising money in that environment? Yeah, so it was pretty interesting because we reported in the fall that Harrison was trying to raise and that he was aiming for this target of $10 million in a round that would value the company at $100 billion. So the fact that he raised $5 million shows that he had to kind of have an expectation reset. Mm -hmm, You know, this mm -hmm. is a really tough market right now. And we usually, I think, don't report on rounds that are this small. But because it was Harrison behind it, this was noteworthy. You know, Harrison left FTX US before all of this happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, He stepped down in September. But there's still this question of what he knew and didn't know in his role. And in the interview, because in addition to you interviewing him for your story, Brett Harrison also spoke to our colleague Sonali for Bloomberg TV, and he did an interview with her. It's so clear that there were deliberate steps taken to mislead investors, to mislead internal employees like myself, to hide what was happening from the general public. And that that has been sort of the most shocking part of all of this, that there was that this was not something that we could have ever really known, given what steps were taken to to hide this from from everyone. But you've known Sam Bankman fried for about a decade, from what I understand. You worked with him back at Jane Street. You were his boss. I wasn't his boss, but we, we were in different departments. You know, I was in the technology side. He was in the trading side. In some of my earliest years at the company, I helped develop a a program at Jane Street to help teach new traders how to program in our internal programming languages. And he was one of my earliest students. So I met him back in, you know, 2013. So would you have any indication from then to now that he that he would have been able to lead the FTX Empower air and that this would have gone this way even between the relationship between the two of you? It was really early days then. I, you know, I, I never could have fathomed that you know he would go on to build this gigantic company, and then of course everything that's happened afterwards, or that you know one day I would go work for him. Now, one of the things we've just heard Brett Harrison say in the context of that interview is that he didn't know what was happening at, you know, FTX Maine, as it were, or FTX International, and that he feels 
deliberately misled by Sam. But one of the other things that also has come across in that interview and others is that the relationship between he and Sam seemed to be tense at best. Yeah, I mean, he published this very long tweet thread in January where he really referred to Sam Pinkman fried as an insecure and prideful manager Mm -hmm. and that he raised red flags about serious organizational problems within FTX. So I talked to him a little bit about that. And he said, you know, that he felt like these were growing pains for a startup in terms of these these organizational issues, you know, that it was not at the the level that it turned out to be in Mm -hmm. terms of, you know, the alleged fraud that happened. Mm -hmm. But he said that he really was met with like a brick wall, you know, in terms of trying to get these things addressed. And that really contributed to him leaving. But the fact of the matter is, is that Harrison was an extremely powerful figure within the FTX empire. He was pretty much the second most visible face of FTX after Sam Bankman fried You know, Harrison did tons of interviews. He appeared at conferences. He would not play League of Legends during media interviews. He was always very focused. He is a compelling public speaker. So I think for some people, it is difficult to reconcile, you know, the amount of influence he had within within FTX with this idea that he really had no idea what was happening here, that he was not involved in any way with wrongdoing. I spoke to a lot of venture capital investors for this story and pretty much none of them would go on record with me. Like they would, they would be like, oh, you know, he's a really nice guy, uh, but I still have questions about what he did and didn't know. So, you know, even some of them who had personal interactions with him and, you know, spoke about him positively were like, I still passed, you know, on on investing in his startup because of this connection to FTX. So I do think it's going to be a difficult road ahead for him. And, you know, but the fact of the matter is there are still people who believe in him. I mean, his investors included Coinbase Ventures, Circle Ventures, and Anthony Scaramucci. And Scaramucci had actually been someone who was burned in the FTX collapse to a pretty significant degree. He sold a 30% stake in his Skybridge Capital firm to FTX, you know, weeks before the company collapsed into bankruptcy. Now, it's interesting that you mention Anthony Scaramucci because he has also told, you know, me, for instance, that he thinks that Brett Harrison is, you know, to quote him, like a good guy and someone that he, despite everything with, as you say, you know, like the FTX international investment and feeling burnt by his relationship with Sam Bankman-Fried, he thinks that Brett is someone that he is willing to put not just trust in, but like invest in as a as a person and as a founder. Yeah, I mean, with Brett, it's pretty interesting. I I had asked him about this. He's like a, a few years older than Sam Bankman Fried. He's he's 34. And I, I was like, oh, you know, what was it like coming to this company with young people? And mm-hmm. he did feel like kind of like the older experienced hand, you know, even though I I would consider him, you know, still early in his career. But yeah, I mean, he he did have a really impressive resume prior to to joining FTX US. He had worked at Jane Street, you know, which we, we've talked about as this very elite quantitative trading firm. Mm-hmm. And that's where he met Sam Bankman-Fried. He had actually trained Sam Bankman-Fried in a, a programming course for traders. You know, he was above him uh, when they were at Jane Street. And he also was at Citadel. You know, this is a guy who had an incredible pedigree. I mean, he's two degrees from Harvard. In talking to him about this, he was like, yeah, it's the the weight of my past accomplishments, the, you know, success I've had at other places that has helped me get to where I am today. So he, he really wants people to look at the whole picture and not just focus on his time at FTX US. You know, among the inner circle, as it were, at FTX and, you know, the people who really lived in the Bahamas, you had someone named Gary Wang, who has kind of come up a lot, especially recently. What do folks need to understand about Wang? What was his role and how did he come to know Bankman-Fried in the first place? 
Gary Wang is this powerful but very elusive figure within the FTX empire. He and Sam Bankman-Fried met at math camp and then later attended MIT together. So just, you know, in general, doing smart person stuff together. And Wang, yes, had a an extremely powerful position within FTX. He was not only a co-founder, but he was also the chief technology officer. And yeah, very quiet dude. From what we know, you know, he, he really, I don't think he ever gave <laughs> any sort of media interview. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't, like the most in- involved manager from what we we know. Mm-hmm. And that kind of left space for other executives to step in. And one of those was Nishad Singh. And Nishad Singh was also on the engineering team. Yeah, so he was head of engineering for FTX. And he had gone to high school with Sam Bigman frieds little brother, Gabe. Uh, you know, that's how Sam knew him. He had gone on to Berkeley both he and Gary considered to be very gifted coders. And Nishad has been credited with, you know, allowing Alameda to essentially have a, a, an advantage on FTX, a trading advantage uh, using code. In the sense that he was the person who allegedly enabled Alameda to be exempt from the risk position controls that everyone else trading on FTX was subject to. Yeah, that's right. It was a, a GitHub account, you know, that you could tra- like trace the code to a GitHub account under his name. And GitHub is where folks, especially, you know, engineering teams, they use it to like collaborate on code. It's almost like Google Docs, but for software. Yeah. Now, so that's that was the engineering team. There were a couple of other important execs. And, you know, I am particularly fascinated with Sam Trabuco. Now, the reason that I'm fascinated with Sam Trabuco is because he, like Brett Harrison, seemed to have extricated himself from, you know, the FTX Alameda orbit before there were any real signs of trouble. He was the co-CEO of Alameda Research. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Both he and Harrison were part of this mass exodus of CEOs Mm -hmm. that happened in in early fall 2022, Mm -hmm. you know, where really the the market downturn in crypto was helping to clean out C-suites at at various, various crypto companies. So, yeah, I mean, there is this question about Trabuco. You know, he seems to be keeping a low profile. Uh, There is a big question of whether he is collaborating with authorities, you know, the way uh, Gary Wang and, you know, his former co-CEO, Caroline Ellison, the way they have, and they, they've both taken guilty pleas at this point. So, yeah, I mean, Trabuco, in theory, would seem to to know a lot. But yeah, there is this question. I think a lot of the people who are, you know, still out there who haven't publicly struck deals yet, their argument, at least this is the case with Brett Harrison, is that there was this wall up around the inner circle. I mean, one of the most shocking things to me that came out of my interview with Harrison was that he didn't know about major deals involving his own company, Mm -hmm. that he found out about FTX US's bailout agreement with BlockFi from the news. So to me, that was shocking. I mean, you're the the president of this company. Yeah, Yeah. you're ostensibly Um, in charge. Yeah, and he said he hadn't talked to Sam in months before he stepped down, you know, that there was just this communication breakdown. So, yeah, I mean, the argument here is like, all right, well, you know, I was not part of the inner circle. Therefore, I did not know about any sort of alleged wrongdoing happening here. Up next, more from Bloomberg reporter Hannah Miller on the very many FTX power players and what they're up to now. How did Caroline Ellison, who became the co-CEO of Alameda Research, fit into all of this? Where, What was the nexus with her and the rest of the folks you've just described? So Caroline met Sam at Jane Street. You know, she's a few years younger than him. They connected there and they ended up meeting up in Berkeley around the time, you know, Sam had, had started building Alameda. Uh, Alameda was in its very early stages mm-hmm. and... You know, basically, and he invited her to join and she took him up on it. And, you know, she rose the ranks to become 
co-CEO alongside Trabuco. And then when Trabuco stepped down, she became the sole CEO. And, you know, that's obviously put her in a, a very bad position right now. And she's admitted to committing fraud. She's taken that guilty plea. But it's really important to remember that not only did she have this professional connection with Sam Bankman fried but they, they did date. They were in a romantic relationship. That, that's just an illustration here of how this was a very young culture, a freewheeling culture. I've, I've heard other people say that the FTX culture was not as crazy as it's been depicted, you know, that people were working too hard to really engage in all this, you know, polyamory and, and drug usage. But I do think it was undoubtedly complicated right. that, you know, and, and you had all these people living together, too. So, you know, everyone was in this, like, luxury apartment together. So again, there there's just these these many layered relationships that has really set up a lot of drama yeah. in the downfall of FTX. Now, just as a kind of a, a closing thought, there were two people who were very close to all of these folks, and they were Bankman Fried's parents. Yeah. So anything I've heard about Joe Bankman and Barbara Freed has been positive, at least among their their colleagues, people who knew them. But their connections to FTX and whether they helped in any way with concealing this fraud or promoting this fraud, you know, th that idea is still very much up for debate. So it's it's interesting. And it, it also comes down to, I think, a very primal question is, you know, what are you willing to do for your child? And I don't know. I mean, it's it, it's hard to say what the connection is here. I mean, we know that they were, you know, living or you know spending time in properties that were owned by FTX. That they you know would go down to the Bahamas. That Joe Bankman was extremely involved um, in FTX's charity efforts. And you know, there's also this idea that Barbara's nonprofit received money from FTX and FTX employees. So it's unclear right now. I mean, we're still learning more. Um, what I know at this point is that they were very respected within the Stanford law community mm -hmm. and that, you know, Sam Bankman fried grew up with these incredible parents who were very focused on law and ethics and, you know, would debate these things at the dinner table. And it's, it's a very interesting contrast with what Sam Bankman fried has allegedly done during his time at FTX. We're still learning more things every day. This is a really complex situation that isn't going to be resolved anytime soon. Mm -hmm. You know, there's still a lot we don't know about who was involved and who wasn't. Um, so, you know, we're just trying to do the best we can to, to talk to people about this and, and figure out what exactly happened here, what led up to this, this massive financial mishap that is something <laughs> that is clearly going to go down in history as a major, major scandal, not only within the world of crypto, but within finance more broadly. Absolutely. Well, Hannah, thank you as always for being on the show. Thanks. That was Bloomberg reporter Hannah Miller. You can find more of her reporting on the Bloomberg Terminal and on Bloomberg.com. And she also contributes to our twice weekly crypto newsletter, which is also called Bloomberg Crypto. This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Send us your comments, questions, or suggestions for the show to crypto at Bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of Bloomberg Crypto is Vicky Vergolina. Our senior producer is Janet Babin. Our producers are Mohamed Farouk and Sharon Bariro. Our associate producers are Ty Butler and Moses Undum. Desta Wonderad is our engineer. Original music by Leo Sidron. I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael. We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> 